again to uh, the, the code review for Dig FM. Um, the topic is AI versus you. Um, it's I'm not getting really deep into artificial intelligence or anything like that. But it just happens to pop up here and there in the solution. So, in, in our attempt to get the solution. A little bit about me. Um, my name is Eric Matthews. I'm an in-house developer at San Jose State University. I'm also a Dig FM coordinator uh, for these meetings. Um, have a few peculiar hobbies, uh, like juggling, as you can see here, and dry land mushing. Uh, uh -huh. Those two dogs would can haul me on a scooter with mountain bike wheels about 20 to 30 miles, which I'm helping, but yeah, 20 to 30 miles, and that's how we won uh, this year's Iron Paws. About this meeting, um, so when we were trying to find out what we're um, what we were going to present on this month, um, Tony actually suggested, well, how about a code review? And I offered, I gave a description of some code I had, and Vince responded with, oh, great, you're, re you're presenting. <laughs> so so um, uh, that, that's what happened. And, and so this is going to be actually a hybrid of a code review, a bit of a presentation. Um, Okay, whoops, well, I'm not ready for that. But in any case, um, here, let me go back. Um, so anyway, um, by when I mentioned code review panel, I mean you, the audience. Uh, this could be a really short meeting if no one responds to my questions or if you don't have any questions. I'm going to demonstrate various features of a simple solution I quickly threw together for an in-house customer. Uh, so... My feelings aren't going to get hurt if uh, the code review panel snickers and say, oh, there's so many better ways to do that because I didn't invest a whole lot into this and I'm not selling it. Uh, you, essentially, you guys already paid for it with your taxes. So, um, As I describe the solution and its features, I have a story that might interest you. And I'm going to ask some, several questions to get you to think about how you would approach the same solution features. You can actually respond to those questions in the chat or raise your hand and, and respond um, in, uh, by voice. In the solution I will be demonstrating, uh, there's nothing very profound, there's nothing sophisticated or difficult. It's all intermediate FileMaker developer stuff. Uh, so it should be easy to understand. But uh, during the meeting, we hope to get some more profound critiques, some approaches and alternatives and resources that we can all take away. Uh, the, the solution I'm demonstrating is only a small part of a much larger higher education solution we call DocuTrack. And I have that up here. These little things are in my way. All right, so yes, that's DocuTrack. Um, it's something I started way back in 2013. So if you're looking at the code, you'll see my bad habits from a long time ago persisting throughout. Um, but anyway, this was to help staff in the document imaging department to quickly track various incoming documents and packages, both paper and electronic. Sometimes it would, they'd, they just need to record that the paper was here. Sometimes they actually would scan it and put it in here. But uh, many of the cases they were just bringing in, the elect it would go out and pick up the electronic documents and keep them here temporarily. That's before they figured out where they wanted to put them in their enterprise-wide electronic content management system, and that's ECM for short. Since then, it has outlived, actually, two enterprise-wide ECMs, which brings me to my first question. How is it that a lowly and even a poorly maintained FileMaker solution can outlive an enterprise-wide solution? Um, so I'm looking for any answers that you might have. Um, the fact that you're more nimble. Yeah, I would take that. <laughs> things can change rapidly, and you can adapt more more easily. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what I that's what I was thinking. Uh, simply because, yeah, when everybody asks for something, they say, "Hey, you know, it'd be nice to be able to do this or do that." Um, we we just do it. Um, you ask that of a large system and they'll they'll consider it for some future release years out in the future. And if those pile up enough, then a lot of these things end up getting replaced. Um, but very, very often they're just too big to fail, so they're just stuck to they're stuck with them. Um, so yes, you uh, anything else? 
You probably yeah, only I have. Gonna, oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Hi, I was going to say um, reporting is a big thing, and when you ask an IT department to get a report on something, it takes them forever to get it. Whereas in FileMaker, it's pretty easy to go ahead and and just create a new report or you know repurpose an existing one with different sorts or different finds. So getting your data back out is easier. Yeah. And then, well, actually, and even somebody, uh, was it Karsten, uh, even suggested the opposite, where it's like you could, your sim your solution just might be simple enough that it it's, what, what is he saying? It's, so, yeah, just simple, easy to use, and it's not confounding anybody with, with other things that are getting in the way. Um, I mean, the other, the other uh, thing is that usually if you use an enterprise solution, you have to adapt to the way it works, its workflow is, whereas um, you can cater or, or design your system exactly to the way that the team wants to, wants to use it. Like, you know, so if you, for example, I don't know, as soon as, a, as, soon as a, 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 an item got scanned. Um, what's that coming from? I don't know. Uh, it sounds like York, maybe, is my proposal. There we go. Yeah. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I, if, you, if you scan, like, for example, as soon as you add something, maybe the requirement might be that some, some system needs to receive a notification that something got added. And maybe this enterprise thing doesn't have that feature. And so you can quickly add more functionality to something, whereas... You know, obviously something that's enterprise like might not have certain features. So, yeah, you can right. quickly adapt. Yeah, I was just telling a because I'm an in house developer and I'm I'm two doors down from one of our primary customers, uh, somebody who uses it a lot and she's the business analyst to help determine, you know, what's needed in the applications that we have. And I, I remind her, like, you know, this is your application. This isn't this isn't my application. You can ask for it and have it work any way you want it to, um, as long as there's as long as there's time to develop it. Um, we can pretty much produce almost anything you can think of. Um, and the the real problem actually we have is getting people to ask for changes because they're just so used to so many other applications they can't even ask. They just put up with whatever they're given. And I, I, every once in a while, I walk by people and see them doing things that are horribly tedious, and they never even bothered to ask for something to streamline that that process. So it's, so it's usually our problem is usually the other way: is trying to get them to ask for things. Um, let's see. So anyway, um, anything else? So, so in fact, doggy track. Um, has integrated with at least half a dozen different external systems and dozens of processes that, that have come and gone. Uh, we can, in fact, some of the ones that are on here, like the next steps and a few of these other ones, that, some that do admission, some that do graduation. Um, so it's connecting to all kinds of things, both inside FileMaker and outside. Um, let's see, if we take a glance at the database design report, where's that at? Here, this is going to take me to my next question. Take a look at the database design report. Um, you can see that the original, um, that one we have in production over, over there at San Jose State, um, has all these tables, scripts, you know. Now, there's like 20 to 30% of this we could actually, because some of these processes come and go, and we've never cleaned out a lot of that stuff. Um, so there's like 20 to 30% of the stuff that's in there could probably be permanently removed and we would never need it again. There's other things that you know, if you'd remove them, you might a couple more, a couple years down the road, somebody like, hey, could we do this? And it was like, you just had it, you know, and then you just deleted it. Um, so the sample that you can download if, you're, if you want to look at this further um, has been pared down quite a bit, which this leads me to my second question. If you want to share a small part of a larger solution with others, like I'm doing, uh, how would you go about doing that? Would you, A, make a copy of the whole solution and remove what you don't want to share? 
B, carefully copy out all the parts of what you want to share to a new file, or C, other. I oftentimes, uh, Eric, there's people that see something and they think, oh, that will be really well suited for us as well. And we've gone down that road where we've just taken a copy basically mm -hmm. and started to work with this other team only to realize that after a few months of working with them, it's like it would have been better to start over just because all their business requirements are so different. Uh, so you you end up you end up putting a lot of exception handling to deal with the the differences that that other group has, and in the end it isn't worth it really. It's mm. just much better to 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 bring your experience and knowledge to bear on something else and just uh, and just say hey we we can borrow bits and pieces of 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 uh, maybe a report or some kind of process, but not the whole thing. It's just, it, it doesn't seem to work unless maybe others have other experiences, but that's been my experience. Hmm. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. That's happened just way too many times. Although when I first heard your question, I, uh, my first thought was kind of sharing a part of it, maybe for another group in the same org, which would kind of be a different scenario. Yeah. So what were what was your intent there? Well, in this example, I'm I'm giving other people code to look at, right? And just get just to get the critique is for this actual meeting here. Um so the the code you can download is actually the second column here. And and I had to make this decision. Well, am I going to just copy out the cuz really there's only 3 tables that that are needed. Um and then you see I can did I didn't remove everything. I just removed all the things that were, were potentially security concerns like the external data source is actually the biggest problem really because the, I think it keeps the passwords exposed. <laughs> so you so we have to remove things like that. So ODBC data sources and and uh, even we removed other FileMaker data sources. We removed all that stuff. Um, and uh, so you can see in this this in this example, I went ahead and went with uh, A. Right, so I just made a copy of the whole solution, and but yes, if I were trying to make a, a nice clean version of something that I wanted to give somebody else, this would I found out for sure this would be not be the way to go because it's it's really kind of hard to, I mean, you're gonna have to go through the process of what do I need and what don't I need, right? And once you've gone that far, I think you can just pick out what you need and put it in a new solution. In this case, I was trying to do this really quickly because we kind of decided this on this meeting last week <laughs> and I had limited time. So I said, well, uh, uh, maybe the quickest thing for me to do is just take the whole take the whole solution and just strip out all the stuff that's definitely not needed. And there's a bunch of things in here I didn't know with, whether it was needed or not, or I could just leave it in there because it's like other stuff that might be interesting. So I just, there was a lot of things I left in there, um, but yeah, took out anything that had a password and took out anything that was com for sure completely unrelated. And a lot of that old stuff that I was talking about that we could have cleaned out, it's probably that 20 to 30% I was talking about. I ended up cleaning out a lot of that too. I said, oh, this isn't so bad. I could probably clean up the original production file as well. Um, so yeah, you could tell me whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, even for this case, but um, that's what I did here. And, and yeah. are there any other solutions? If I was to chime in, and I've done this yeah. before, you're going to miss something if you are pu pulling it out of your, your production system. There's going to be something, either if it's a control table that you've got data in that's got something to do with the client, um, whether it's the data in the files or the schema, hmm. you are having to make sure you know that system so well that you know exactly what to pull out, where mm -hmm. it, it's going to take you longer. But if you were to create a brand new file, then you know what's in there is only what you actually need. Um, and even to the idea of what Vince was saying before about not making the client, matching the client's needs, I've seen some developers who do work with the template that they do continue on the same invoicing structure for all their clients. And I've taken these over, opened them up, 
and I've seen logos on layouts for previous clients. Yeah. Now that may not sound like a big deal, but it's 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 you know if your new client found out that the old client logo is there, what else is there that you you know shouldn't be there? Yeah. So you are you are much cleaner starting from scratch. Yeah, agreed. I'll take one, that as yes. One other uh, source of uh, compromise or data leak, as you say, is uh, global fields uh, that uh, take values because you've run it locally and you don't have a script or manually clear them out. Uh, I've run into a number of cases where. Uh, data, databases do get run uh, locally, and it could be part of your development cycle. Uh, but if you haven't included an explicit clearing of your globals, uh, you will end up uh, uh, propagating whatever the data was there. And a number of folks uh, do use resource tables. In some cases, I found that the resource table is really full of global fields that are manually updated when the database is run locally, because that was an easy thing to do. And of course that doesn't work on server, but uh, nevertheless, it, it, it actually uh, is a way that the, the field can uh, leak out of your uh, solution if you don't clear it. That's a good point. Hey, James, I'm glad you're here because you always bring up the security concerns. <laughs> uh, yeah, in fact, th so in, yeah, in this case, I do have something close to what you describe. I do have a resource table gobs of globals in it most of them are set um when on open but nevertheless i download you know i were to download that file and and run it it would have a lot of those globals in there so in this case what i actually did is actually on the server i did a uh, i created a uh a clone and i took the clone out and i don't think the clone would have any of the globals in them after at that point oh unless it had it when i still had it from a yeah i'm not sure about that yeah, if I was running it locally and then put it up, I don't know if it would keep the globals. But in any case, it didn't have any any records at that point because it's a clone. Um, and then from the clone, I stripped out all the stuff I didn't need. Even if you have uh, no records, you still have values in your globals. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Correct me if even I'm wrong. If I have no, uh, even if I have no records? Yeah, that's like, correct. Uh, yeah. Globals are really a table-based field, not a record-based field. Ah, yeah, I, I call them record zero, so yeah. that it will yeah. always be in the table, the globals. I, if you call it record zero, then I know we're not talking about counting in, in you know, something like JavaScript, but record zero, it's always there. Huh. Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a... Go ahead, Tony. Oh, go. oh, all right, thanks. The, so there's a tip regarding globals on a hosted file. It was originally um, out of the Pittsburgh group, terrific group, um, and it was popularized by FM Disk. The tip is as follows. You can actually clear the globals on a hosted file without dehosting it. I'm gonna drop a link from, if I can find it, from the FM Disk where they talked about it and demoed it. You can even do it with a graphic, like an icon using some of the more recent recent features. Um, that And that all said, so A, you can do it, which makes it easier because, you know, who wants to dehost files just to clear globals? I wouldn't, uh, so you don't have to. And then number two, I do believe it is best practice. We use a resource table construct. I do believe it's best practice to make sure that your globals are clean to start. Even if you're setting them with a resource table, you know, with a non-open script, still they should be clean in, a, in an empty and or benign state. Uh, and now I'm going to go look for that FM disk thing. Another way to do that would be to just uh, uh, have a script on close that clear that clears them. And that way, if you ever open the file locally, when you close it, those globals are cleared when you close the file. Uh, yep. All good points. Yeah. Also, uh, check your custom functions um, because uh, that is actually coding with perhaps data in there. Uh, that may reveal proprietary information or intellectual property that you do not intend to pass on, but you are actually giving your other client. So that I, I've run into that sometimes because sometimes you get you know, clever 
and mm -hmm. uh, you embed certain pieces of information that should not leave your area. You know, sometimes I date when I every once in a while I'm dealing with something like this, and I daydream. It's like, would it be nice if I could just grab, if I were to say, hey, I want this layout. And this this actually sounds what like what add-ons do, right? It's if I could just grab this one layout and it would just pull everything that was attached to it, like all the all the tables, all the custom functions, value lists, anything that might potentially be connected to it, you know, go you know as it reaches out and then just rip that out, put that somewhere in one swoop rather than having to try to figure everything out, um, you know, in a more manual fashion. I don't know if that would actually work, um, but yeah, it's something new. Gee, it'd be nice. <laughs> but yeah, I think add-ons. Well, of course, add-ons are done preemptively that way, right? You you figure out what's going to be in your add-on solution, you package that up somehow, and I don't know exactly how. It, but the I think the way I saw it described is something like that, right? You could you could actually put in a, an add-on. And then take it back out again, and it would go remove all the things that were connected to it. Hey, Eric, um, there was a really good question. Uh, brought up a lot of thoughts here. I'll try and go quick. Uh, if you want to share a small part of a larger solution, um, jumping around a little bit here, I, I've moved a little bit towards multi-file architecture. You know, so if if I have a really good image management module or a good tagging module or good correspondence generation module they're not part of a monolithic file they're separate files therefore easier to share a small part that's number one number two uh I, this is we, we have one customer who i think is a little bit similar uh to your setup um your client base and for them we have some files that are division specific um because they're so different what they do, you know, even if they're both doing invoices, let's say they do it so very differently, they can't share the same file. Uh, we have, on the other hand, for them, some files that are um, shared because like a barcode generation utility file, for instance, um, image man, you know, so it's a mix of uh, specific and shared. And then the final final is the idea of um, multi-tenant solutions. We actually have been playing around a little bit with that, uh, you know, with the privileges uh, and some other constructs to um, have people, you know, cohabitating, you know, multi-tenant living in the same file situation. So anyway, I think it's a good, good, good question. Uh, brings up a lot of topics. So I guess the only thing I can offer C is that, you know, get using, a, using a clone, that's actually, I didn't take an actual copy of the file, but actually I took a clone. So that's or B, B part two, I guess. I, I thought maybe Inspector Pro could do this for me, but no, <laughs> it could help. <laughs> it, could, it could help. But uh, what Tony said about a multi-tenant system, especially if you have different departments and they need to do the same thing, then you know with security maybe uh you can you know carve out some some areas where uh you know again they can only see their only their their data and so you add a new feature then everybody gets it yeah. um and that's yeah. kind of what this is doing right because this is really just one of many different solutions that are you know that's that are used in-house and a lot of these are interconnected and making use of data that's in other files. Mm -hmm. All right, so anyway, out of the 60 tables that came from the production file, there's actually only three that I'm using in this demo. And, and that is, oh, hey, open to my status bar. There we go. And that would be this doc, this document table. All right. Um, so the, yes, yeah, the mainstay of the of this DocuTrack is the document table. It has the containers and various metadata fields that keep bringing me back to DocuTrack whenever someone wants to briefly or permanently store some documents that don't have a home in our enterprise ECM. In fact, when customers uh, finally decide, you know, how and when they want to store um, these documents in the in the ECM system. 
DocuTrack provides the functionality of sending both these documents and any metadata that, that might be connected to it to their new home. Uh, in the meantime, we provide various tables and even relationships from other solutions like I showed earlier. Um, now, let's see. Hey, Eric, a quick question. Yeah. Are you also extracting the text from these documents as part of the DocuTrack? Yeah, but it's, it, that's not, well, I'm gonna give an example here in FileMaker that okay. can do it, um, mm -hmm. but it's we're actually doing it externally okay. from, with another solution. Anyway. So, um, so now, now I'm going to go ahead and describe uh, uh, what the customer's need was. So, let's see. Yeah, their latest document related need um, that brought me back to that DocuTrack solution was the customer needed thousands of paper pages of graduation rosters, and they wanted to scan and OCR the text so that they could look up people on those rosters. Notice that there's multiple people per page. Or is that in fact eight exactly? Um, when you look at the page, they're obviously computer printouts. Now, I was, actually I was running around trying to answer this question today. So, so my question to them was, I said, hey, you know, where, where's all the computer data for these printouts? I mean, you're asking to scan this stuff back in again. And uh, I said, Would, wouldn't you have the data somewhere? It was on a computer, you can tell, right? Um, and they don't have it. And that means something turning, this is going through my head and I said, that means someone decided it was more important to keep this paper copy than to, act, to keep the actual data, um, the electronic original. So I've been, I've been there for over a quarter of a century now, right? In those departments. And these departments have been actively been trying to get rid of paper and make everything electronic that whole time. But just a few years before that, like 1991 was the last catalog, just shortly before I got there, someone made the exact opposite decision, All right? So this, my, this was my third question. The customer has thousands, well, like 23,000 to be exact, uh, thousands of paper pages of graduation rosters they want to scan to OCR. Oh, wait, no, that's not the question. There's the question. In 1991, what are some of the reasons, faulty or not, that someone would decide to keep paper rather than the original digital copy? Hmm. Maybe back then computers weren't so reliable. <laughs> Having a, a paper copy was like a better way to ensure. Yeah, that there's one the person I know. She her her office is well. I think she finally cleaned it up, but for decades she was even after almost most of that stuff had went electronic. She had printouts, boxes of printouts stacked high on her walls in her office, and uh, she was she was a definite hoarder. <laughs> Uh, one, one reason the electronic media changed, you know, we had we had uh, paper tape, electronic tape, uh, hollow earth cards, uh, you know, moved to the floppy versions we have now. So as things mm -hmm. change, maybe they didn't have the way to read what they had. I know when you, yeah, when you're talking to somebody days, it seems inconceivable, right? It's like, you know, twenty three thousand pages, right? What's a big deal? <laughs> you could, so yeah. I used I, to I, run a, a conversion service for people who had uh, <clears throat> gotten rid of the software or media readers uh, and they could no longer access their digital because uh, mm -hmm. they had a, a whole uh, separate office set up with uh, different kinds of um, uh, readers, Cyquest cartridges, orb drives, zip drives, uh, uh, you name it, um, that uh, of different sizes and what, uh, but if you can't read it, or even old-fashioned data CDs, you know, how many computers actually come with an optical drive these days? At least yeah. you, can, you can buy them. So uh, I know in my particular employer, uh, they lost, or they had standardized on uh, PageMaker, uh, and yet, yeah, and yet uh, they did not keep, uh, they kept the digital, but they didn't keep the, the reader for the digital. They also didn't keep the software that run it, or if they had the software, it didn't run on any computer they still owned. So yeah. you can, you know, you can look at the life cycle. 
So um, the uh, National Archives and Records Administration, uh, the NARA, uh, establishes quite a few standards if you're a federal facility for record main, uh, maintenance and management. And we still have uh, uh, film vaults of lots of stuff. Um, and uh, nothing has uh, really super replaced it. It gets really, really tough to do it. But yes, document paper actually uh, kept under the right conditions or microfilm that's kept under the right conditions. Uh, in many cases, you have to have over 100 years worth of archive storage. Uh, I think, I think there, are, there have been no computers that old. Mm. Yeah, I guess it is a little harder to lose paper and it's really sticks out. <laughs> Unless you actively go lifting right. tons of paper to get it out of the way, then it, you you don't just lose paper unless there's a fire or something. But yeah, and I've or, had some customer, by the way, that that uh, they they had a database that was done by a developer, uh, a really clever developer, and they didn't want to pay her anymore. So they said, "Give us the master password," and they sent her packing, and. Uh, one of the Oops. things they wanted to change was the ground rules on how the thing worked. So this particular one was keeping track of records, actually course records, uh, the, the approval cycle for training courses. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the database was designed such that you would never delete the parent record in very elaborate ways of locking that down. Um, and one of the things that was built into it was a chain a cascade delete of children that should you absolutely do that you could delete the children well guess what uh, happened they went in and they changed it such that they didn't like to have space or unused spaces or unapproved things so they started cleaning it up by getting rid of things that were not approved and guess what that did to all the children oh no <laughs> So you have your digital copy, uh, even your backups may be very subject to destruction if you think it. Uh, and the only way that they were able to get their official records back was because there was a pack rat in the organization that had no. walls and walls of binders with the originals. Oh, wow. Yeah, everybody was making fun of that person just before that, right? <laughs> David, you have your hand up. Oh, oh yeah, I, I was just thinking that yeah, in 1991, you know, disk drives weren't as big as they are today, and I I can imagine people getting rid of stuff, uh, you know, at that time. And if they were doing backups, they might have actually been doing backups on floppies. So I I, I can understand why they might uh, might get rid of stuff because you know now we have multi terabyte size drives, and we don't even think anything of it. <laughs> so, so yeah, that was pretty close to my hypothesis is that it had something to do with the cost, right? And um, so this, I looked this up. This is the cost of, and this is actually a, a logarithmic table. So like each line is like a hundred times larger <laughs> in scale. Um, so back in 1991, a terabyte was $2.8 million dollars. And of course, I did the math on that, and it's like, well, what's it like? It's it's two point eight million divided by twenty one thousand seven hundred. Um, it's approximately one hundred twenty nine point zero three two two. All right, so it only would have cost them one hundred twenty nine dollars to keep that in storage back in nineteen ninety one, right? Um, so yeah, so it doesn't sound like a big deal. Um, and by the way, this is this is the linear um, version of that of that graph. You can see everything like just shot down really quick there. But then, so and then 1997, when I got there, um, and I was looking at this stuff, they were it, the the price drastically changed. That's only forty eight thousand dollars per terabyte. Um, uh, so I, I could see them, yeah, that maybe reconsider. But you know, still, again, what one hundred twenty nine dollars or one hundred thirty bucks? That's no big deal. But you know, as what happens though is that people in 1991 weren't necessarily, you know, they were making decisions. They weren't making decisions, right? The decision to 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 keep paper and get rid of things was probably made a long time ago. So I actually went back to not the most 1991 was the most recent catalog. The oldest one was back in 1971. So here in 1974, it's it would cost you 185 million dollars for a terabyte. 
So now we're talking about real money. It's up in the thousands now for, for keeping a hold of this stuff. And then, of course, then backup and everything else, I imagine, would, would multiply what that storage would be, the storage requirements. And so here we are today, and, you know, it's like 14 bucks for a terabyte, I guess. That sounds pretty low, but I guess maybe if you're buying it on a large scale or out in the cloud. That sound right? Mm, I think so. I, yeah. I the price is likely. But, you okay. know... Oh, the other thing to point out on this graph, by the, the these aren't adjusted for inflation. So, yeah, back in 1997 or 1974, that's that's really 185 million dollars. Not today's 185 million dollars. So. Wow. I, um, I guess... Sorry, just on cost, I had one client that didn't want to go ahead with the the database we're building because he'd spent so much money on the carbon copy books. He wanted to make sure that they used those first and then the electronic system. And that was a, a whole stock room full of carbon copy books. I was talking to uh, somebody who's, who had this, had this as a, she's actually in charge of imaging department now, but she also worked at IBM and some other places that were doing imaging. And she said, yeah, she's been through the whole cycle where like at IBM, they had everything on paper and Oh, no, on paper, they had everything on the computer. They printed it out, put it on microfiche because that was cheaper. And then she was there. She was doing this job long enough to watch microfiche go back to to uh, electronic again. So she's seen it go back and forth the whole cycle. Uh, you know, like if you go look back in the 80s and the 90s and, you know, the storage that we had and it was like wow you know my first mac plus was a 20 megabyte hard drive and i got i paid uh, almost 900 dollars for that mega that 20 megabytes to attach to that mac plus right and uh, 20 megabytes that's just a single file these days you know yeah. but um you know and then you fast forward and you think like wow you know it's a completely different world these days and then you think about the storage of even things like, um, you know, the amount of YouTube data that gets, you know, flooding every day, the, uh, every day, every minute, every hour, you know, you can't, yeah. you can't possibly even watch it all. I, I don't even know where, where they're storing all that stuff, but uh, I came across this thing I posted in the, in the chat called uh -huh. rewind.ai and I haven't tried it yet, but the promise is, is unbelievable. Um, Ask, ask rewind.ai anything you've seen, said, or heard. Oh, and really? It, yeah. And, uh, you know, like, I just don't know how it does it, but supposedly it's, it's phenomenal. Um, and anyway, that's, you know, that's today. And fast forward, you know, 10, 20 years from now, who knows what, 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 you know, where we'll be, but. Um, yeah, I know the decision. It's just like one of these examples here, right? You're, the, the way they made decisions, it, mm -hmm. not being able to see the future, you didn't know. You, you didn't know that. Wow, I should have hang. Just if I hung on to that data, maybe a few more years, the <laughs> the storage had been way cheaper, and it would have been all right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I do want to bring attention to the. By the way, the the file and the, the sample data in this file. If you if anybody wants to play with this, um, at that download page. Um, so I'm. I'm providing, uh, what am I providing? Providing uh, the, the actual, some actual images and the output, the OCR output from that, um, which of course brings me to my fourth question. Um, you wanna share sample text or field data and you need to anonymize the data for personal privacy. How would you go about doing that? Anybody got any clever tricks or anything? I, mm. I think there's a database somebody has created that will actually like generate uh, sample data in FileMaker. I don't remember the name of it, uh, it but uh, that that's that's one idea where you're not even you're not even just taking existing data. It, it will be just generating records for you that are out of thin air. So that would be the way I would think about doing it. I, I don't remember if that's in the marketplace or not, but I, I have seen uh, 
uh, or heard of a tool uh, that that does that. Yeah, Fabio actually demoed something for us today in a meeting where he used the Claris Connect flow to uh, to uh, request uh, fake data, and it came back as a as a JSON object. And I don't remember the um, the 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 actual Connect uh, source, but yeah, there are. If you just do a search for you know generate fake data, you'll find a, a bunch of them. And FileMaker related, but this this is connected to uh, to Claris Connect. Now I don't know oh. if he used he did something custom. I'd have to ask him. But anyway, there's there's a bunch of data that, like places where you can generate fake data and get it as as CV, CSV or JSON or whatever your preference is. You know. Yeah. So in this case, I was only dealing with 24 records, so I just mm -hmm. in my hand, as you can tell. Um, Let's see. So it also brings you me to my. You, huh? you definitely yeah. want to automate that. You don't want to do it by hand. <laughs> yeah, if you're getting into the hundreds <laughs> of thousands, right? <laughs> that, I, I guess that goes to your comic, right? Like how many? <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, something. Yeah. Like oh yeah, yeah. I didn't do all twenty-three thousand pages. No. <laughs> and so there's a now this gets even harder, right? So the fifth question is like, uh, if the sample data you want to share is images, how would you go about anonymizing the information on the images? Because that's the demo here is actually taking the images and and doing things with them. Um, so generate them from ChatGPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. but but ChatGPT doesn't work with images, does it? A it, new version does, three point five and above. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It, you think it could go in here and edit this? Uh, you could. What do you mean? You might be able to ask it for like something like this kind of output, like you know, like uh, I don't know what this is called. This output is called, but like you know, something that looks like out of a dot matrix printer, and generate you know something. I, I'm sure. I'm sure with a little bit of tweaking, you could actually get it to generate this. Yeah, this, this is my this of course. My dream would be would you know, hey, find all the names in here and just anonymize them all, right? And that would be, that would or, be great. Or just feed it a sample and then and uh, of this image and say generate you know like something like this but for a hundred thousand people or fake yeah. fake names and and scores whatever. I'll give that a try. Um, but yeah, very often you find out that well again I'm dealing with twenty four records and just finding out whether or not something does something and finding out how to do it takes longer than actually just doing it. So um, by hand. Um, but yeah, okay, so in this just case, I just did one, right? One page. Well, I did three, just uh, as an example. But yeah, it wasn't that big a deal. Because it's like but this yes. is the pattern of the page that we're parsing, and a little Photoshop just to overlay that, which you have to. That's pretty you much. You probably what don't I did even here. have to, and not, you, you know, just you could leave San Francisco. That's. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow this this person got Costco, but in any case, the. Uh, yeah, I didn't do that. But yeah, you can you actually see the parts I changed, right? There's you, the font's not quite the same. It's not quite the same size, but it wasn't worth trying to get exact. And I couldn't actually find a font that exactly matched this anyway. So I kind of I I could find the name of it, but I couldn't find it the download for free anyway. So that's good. You're showing your work. <laughs> so anyway, yes, a little bit obvious there. Um, so uh, yeah, let's see. So if you all right, so I got that fifth question. Um, so for the, yeah, this project, um, the first and second tasks were to get the paper scanned into images and the images and OCR'd into data. So my sixth and seventh question, yes, are what are some of the examples how you would scan paper documents for FileMaker containers? Um, and and then that's along with that, it's like what would you do to capture data? From the images, you know, that is OCR them, right? Get the data out and put it into a field. You guys, anybody have any solutions for that? Start with a good scanner. Yeah. Now you get it into FileMaker. Isn't there a, 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 yeah. step, a script set where you can extract data from an image? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do have. Um, what's that? You remember what that's called? It's the live text. Yeah, I get live text. text. But yeah, getting the images though, how would you do that? 
you could, uh, if, if you scanned it all to PDF, this is, uh, we have a snap scan. I have a snap scan. I'm looking at it and it'll scan, uh, produce a multi-page PDF. And then uh, Mac OS service, uh, which is actually built into the automator. So mm -hmm. you can quickly build a Mac OS service that will uh, split a multi-page PDF into individual pages, at yeah. which point you can have a FileMaker relatively simple scripted routine that, uh, you know, you give it the root path and then you, um, your files are all going to be predictably named. Yeah. Um, and just bring them all in one page per. Okay, so you're yeah. using a third party thing that's like well, it's Apple. running a separate application, right? I mean, it's the tools that are built into the Apple operating system. Mm. Um, Mac OS services is, is tremendously useful. It's kind of part, it's it's sort of like a flavor of Apple script or something, but it's all built into the core technology. You don't have to buy anything. It's built in, it's shipped by Apple. Um, but yeah, I, I scan a lot of uh, multi-page PDFs Mac OS service and then import them. And at that point you're all in FileMaker and then you, uh, then you go to work, you know, then you, then you're in FileMaker land, things get easier. It's PDF JS. So let me put that in the chat. JavaScript. Yeah, there's command line utilities that you can call from FileMaker that uh, we'll do a lot of PDF splitting and combining and uh, all kinds of things. We've done that a little bit. Is that a plugin? Uh, or that... No, these are just JavaScript command code? line utilities. Oh, okay. Uh, and Monkey Bread can do a lot of that stuff as well. Oh, yeah. That was my, that was my plug there for Monkey Bread. They, um, apparently, they can actually do both the... I guess they have a means to get the data, get the images in I think from a scanner and they, they do have an OCR solution built into theirs. Um, of course, that's our inside joke, right? I mean, if you ever asked, Hey, can FileMaker do this? And when you can't, then he, <laughs> he always, he always pops up and says, yeah, we got something, we got a solution for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it's, I mean, I guess it would be um, the volume that, you know, you'd have to kind of uh, deal with, right? Like if you just have 10, 10 pages, you can, you know, even use the, the iPhone app from Adobe scan, which aligns the corners and everything and creates a PDF. And you can then, you know, send that PDF to the, to the database mm. and start that way. But then, you know, that takes time, right? If take a picture of each one, but you know, if you have again a handful, it's not a big deal. But if you have a few thousand, all of a sudden it's like it's a whole different scale, and you want to automate for that scale. And 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 then not to not to mention this, the consideration of where you store them, right? External storage, or uh, do you want to store them in S3 uh, externally, not in the database, uh, etc. So a lot of things to consider, especially yeah, if you have a lot of them. Yeah, so my first question to them was like, well, don't you have an enterprise system that does this, right? You have a bunch of scanners that are hooked up to your enterprise ECM system. Surely it could just do this for you, right? And just scan things in. And, and apparently that everything's tied into these workflows that are kind of complicated and they're always asking, they're always getting, um, they're going to cut the contract out to get them, get them done. And this is actually not a permanent solution anyways. They only have, it's, it's like, it's got a beginning and an end, right? And it's not... It's only twenty three thousand records, and they got to be, and it doesn't fit whatever model they've already got there. And it apparently is too complicated to twist it to work the way they want it to. So that's why we're doing this. Um, so, yeah, what it may, uh, Eric, if I may, Vince brought up a really good point um, uh -huh. about the scale, and I feel guilty because I mentioned Apple Script and Automator, which is would target a small scale operation. Mm -hmm. Uh, if if things get big, you you go to shell script, which is more complicated code. And the gentleman mm -hmm. who was talking about the command line utilities, uh, the PDF parsing and combining uh, seems to be available through a variety. You know, uh, Python is what I think Automator taps into. JavaScript 
is you know very robust uh and then if it's shell script it's command line so you can stitch together an enterprise class solution that runs mm -hmm. super duper fast command line runs so much faster than apple script it's harder to write it's harder to mm -hmm. read but it's faster so vince made a good point and the gentleman with the comment about javascript command line you put it all together and you got a solution yeah if you're not paying yeah but you're still kind of paying attention to the uh, chat, by the way, if you're not, because there's a lot of good resources in there. Yeah, you um, you still have to deal with the physical physicality of it. Like, uh, yeah. I guess, uh, Eric, you actually have these, I forget how many thousands of pages, you know, that you have physically to deal with. So maybe there is, um, maybe there's a company where you can just send the paper to and, and they scan it and send you back you know, multiple PDFs of each paper and, and all that, right? So that you don't oh, yeah. have to do that yourself. Oh yeah, actually they did, they do, they did outsource this. They had another project where it was like the pieces of paper were in the hundreds of thousands and they took, boxed all that stuff and shipped it out and had somebody do it. And in this case, you know, they, you know, but they're on a regular basis, they're scanning documents anyway. So they do have these production scanners here and so what they did is they did actually take advantage of the Fujitsu scanners they have and the Fujitsu scanners did come with some software that would allow them to capture all that and control that so they were doing that outside of their main ECM system but they were still able to utilize the scanners that they had and the software that came with those scanners so that was I guess, good news for them. I guess the other concern I would have is when you have like that amount of of uh, you know, let's say you have hundreds of thousands of pages, right? And, you know, uh, you get to look at the, the output and and the uh, who's going to do the verification of, like, yeah, yeah. The, you know, like that Did is you get a good not, image? you know, that, that image didn't get scanned correctly. And now you're getting, you know, Fran Francisco or instead of San Francisco and, yeah, yeah, I got San Fran Costco. And, uh, yeah, they, exactly. There. <laughs> yeah, so that that would be a big concern of mine, you know, like quality assurance that everything is is actually transcribed right in the, in the proper manner. Not. Yeah, I guess the so with the Fujitsu software that they had, the one thing they didn't have is OCR, right? So then we had to think about okay, how are we going to OCR this data? And that's when I remembered that. Um, do I have it here? And I remember that uh, Claire's FileMaker had get live text. And I thought, oh, okay. It was, it was 19.5 that it came out, right? And yeah. and I played, I think I, no, I guess I'd never played with it in FileMaker. I, I, I learned about it late on the, being on the phone. I thought, oh, this is really cool. You like take a picture of something and copy out the text, right? Uh, in, uh -huh. your, in your photos on your iPhone. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, I think must have I must have remembered somewhere or somebody mentioning this, and I went and looked up if, if FileMaker Pro or and Go could do this, and sure enough, it had just when when did nineteen five come out last year, year before? Nineteen five came out. Nineteen right? six was in December, so nineteen five last last year sometime. Yeah, so just in time, really. Um, so I. Uh, we played around with this, and so back in the solution, that's actually what we have. This little button I have right here. I click that. Um, it reads all that text right out pretty fast, right? Um, it's not perfect, but I mean, if somebody, if I just wanted to do really quick and dirty, I could just like capture this data and just do searches out of this data. But the problem is. Of course, it's all, it's not parsed, right? You get, we've got everybody's records all in one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, so. uh, I mean, if, if like we're talking really big scale, then, yeah. you know, it would be one of these things where you just set up a website and you do like, what is it when you say I'm not a robot, you do these <laughs> things and then you tell people to, to verify some text that you scanned. If it, what are the words, you know, so you get people to do your work for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, and then the other thing too, I could still put, I could put tens of thousands of these in there and then run that on a, on a loop and a script and it would just go mm -hmm. through and do all of them. So that, that was actually what was in my mind as soon as I found that this was here. Um, but we had some problems, but anyway, well, first of all, so, you know, even though get live text 
can, has you specify the language and you can, I specified US English, like weird things show up in here. Um, you say like, like, what is that? What is that? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Chinese or Japanese characters in here. Um, here's another one. Yeah, and so some weird things pop up. It's like, yeah, <laughs> how did you get that? Especially then I specified English, right? Um, so in any case, uh, so there was things like that. Um, yeah, it, there's, and there's no way to configure the, the character set, right? It's like, well, don't, don't put that in there. Guess something else, right? Because mm -hmm. where's that next to San Bruno? That's uh, what's on there, San Bruno. That's the um, HLDJ. Actually, you notice that. Look, see that HLDJ up there? Oh, no, it's just yeah. up here. Where's, where's the San Bruno? Oh, right here, right? San mm -hmm. Bruno. You see, that, see how the HLDJ came after? This is this, this is the problem I was looking for. Wait, wait, what was I looking at? Or San Bruno? I lost it. New York. Oh, here. There it is. Mm -hmm. Um, see that HLDJ came after. Mm -hmm. But this is the line before, so you, it didn't even interpret the lines properly. That, that's a that I'm going to describe. That's a problem, <laughs> right? That's gonna, actually going to make it really hard to parse this data. Because it's not labeled city, it's not labeled name. It's, there's some things have labels, some things don't. So if it's labeled, yeah, it's easy to go find the label and then go find the data that comes after. But if it's not labeled, then what do you do? And if it's mm -hmm. if it's not in a consistent location, um, what are you what are you going to do with that? Um, yeah. Your your so, scan is pretty dirty. Like there's a lot of smudges like in there. Yeah, and maybe it's reading the smudges. And making mm -hmm. best guesses on them, but you know, if I had, I mean, obviously there's some kind of what we might call artificial intelligence just to do this this thing here. But there's other things it's not doing and, and taking cues from. I mean, like those dashed lines, it's not it's not utilizing them to try to figure out what because because you you and I can spot right there right the, that the name is right next to a date and next to a nurse next to the major and the rank. That's all on one line. It doesn't always get that. It, it, it's so it's not intelligently figuring those things out on a consistent basis. Um, so, yeah, anyway. I mean, this this technology is really meant for like, you know, take a picture of a port sale sign and, <laughs> and, and uh, you extract the, the phone number so you can call the realtor so you can buy the home. It isn't really going to scale well for for this application for what you want to do. You know? Right. So that's for that reason. Uh, uh, and the other reason, of course, that that department uses Windows exclusively. So it, it, this is a no go on Windows. Uh, so we didn't pursue that option. But if you'd like to compare and try to parse the data that comes out of that, you're uh, welcome to go at it. Um, but it's, it's in there. Um, but in any case, uh, we end up using the sample data that and we from another application it's called um uh, so do i have it on here abby uh, i guess i don't have it up here but yeah we have, there's a, a there's an application abby makes all kinds of the abb yy um there's the application they already had was was fine reader and coincidentally even though they're using windows they happen to have that on a mac and so that's what they ended up using the scan to get the ocr out of all those images um, let's see. So some OCR tries to create zones and, and find columns of text. That was the other thing that happens. Let's see if I can show that. Oh, here it is. Oops. There we go. So you see what it's doing here is it, it's automatically doing this, right? So you can see in this example here, it's, it's finding blocks of text. So it figured that out. And except here, it put these two as one big block, but it was no big deal, right? Because it's because it's just going to read from left to right on this, so that, that's okay. At least that's consistent. But you see here on the second page, it broke it up into two columns. 
right? And not even quite consistently there, but yeah, that's two columns there. So that's not working so great. So yeah, between here and here, I'm gonna get different output. And here, that's back to single column again, except right in the middle, it broke up into seven columns and here I think it's six columns on this one. Um, so it's, yeah, the, the output, the default output from this program was really bad because it wasn't consistent. So what we ended up telling it to do, because it was, you know, there's really three columns here that you can see, right? There's, there's this one over here, that this stuff in the middle with maybe some data in between and a third column. Um, it was too much to go through all eight rows and specify each, you know, each section. So we just said, all right, just skip that. Just do one big field, just scan best you can, get it from left to right, all the way down through the through that. And so that's the data that we're that we're using. Um, I mean, at this, least it gets it gets each row, like yeah. kind of right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, but you see what's going to happen in this box right here. It's going to instead of going all the way across, it's going to go down and then over to the next column. Mm -hmm. So. Whereas this one, it would have been across. So if I was looking for one thing to appear after another while I'm scanning through the text to pick out pieces, it's not going to be consistent for me. Um, unless, so that's why we make just one big field and, or one big zone and just go through the whole thing. So anyway, that that's uh, that goes with my eighth question here. Oh, hold on, Darren had a question. Yeah. yeah just, I'm sitting here listening to the brain's trust that we have in the uh -huh. file maker that's pretty pretty deep, you know. And I thought I'd put the same question into chat GTB and see what its response would be. Um just as an exercise. Uh -huh. Um and it's talking about creating strip script steps. The first time I asked it, it told me there was a plugin from Geist called um oh. Actually, the response is gone. I get live text, and then I asked it to rerun it again, and it's saying with FileMaker's get live text function, you can extract text directly from an image stored in a container or without using external OCR. And it actually gives you the steps that you would need to put into FileMaker to run these steps. Oh, wow. Um, as to the first one talked about a plugin from Geist, and now that now I've told it to regenerate it, it's gone back out further into the web and then started talking about the get live text function. Um, yeah, however, however, Darren, I think he went down that path, Eric, and realized oh. that the quality isn't isn't gonna is Oh gonna yeah, that's later in this presentation. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm jumping the gun. No, but that's good. Actually, no, I didn't even think of it at that level. I was like, yeah, there's coding stuff I was asking it, and I'll, I'll talk about that later. But yeah, just asking more surface level questions, you know, high level questions like these is actually yeah it it's uh another way to get answers and you guys uh you guys gotta step up the game if chat gpt is gonna give us <laughs> so if you didn't think of <laughs> one thing to be careful of with chat gpt especially generating filemaker code yeah. which it will happily do for you it does hallucinate a lot and will come up <laughs> with functions that do not exist oh i got an example of that too yeah, yeah. Oh, nice i like it Wow. Maybe oh, you don't have that? That's too bad. <laughs> Maybe it knows more about the future of the script steps than even Claris now. I know. Huh? It, it, it hacked it hacked Claris. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Way back when in assembler code, uh, it was uh, quite a, a trip to to make up uh, different uh, uh, assembler call, uh, functions and uh, some of the ones I seem to remember would be analogous to the hallucinations like uh, uh, halt and catch fire and execute programmer and stuff like that. <laughs> All right, so here's question eight. Now that you have the data captured from the images, how are you going, um, how are you going to put it into your FileMaker solution? All right, so this is the, the example of the data that we captured. Yeah, yeah. so I guess you may have an answer for that. It's pretty. Uh, 
to wow. is the question how would you parse it out once you've got the text? yeah yeah so would, i mean just like real quickly like what, what, i don't know what method would you use to parse this and get this in there it looks like it has name value pairs with a colon so you know what data you're talking about and if they actually are really grouped by that um the the dash line then you would say that's one record. So it might not be too hard. I mean, that's the way we used to read in form data from like email. Once you come up with a good pattern, then it's a matter yeah. of, you know, capturing here's where it starts and here's where it ends. And, and yeah. you know, this is a, a piece of data that matches this particular field. So I don't know if you can see on this screen here, like, um, because, you know, I was looking for things like that. Well, you know, in many cases, comments comes just before the, the name. Comments is a line above, name is a line below. Except that's not always the case. The very top of the page, it's got printed on. And then comes the name. So, okay, there's two different things I could look for, right? But then there's there's these dashed lines. And sometimes the lines aren't dashed, they're dotted. There's, there's other kinds of inconsistencies where I started getting kind of nervous. Like, ah, I don't know if I want to program for that. Um, so... In any case, actually, in fact, I was thinking about it you know, maybe for a couple of hours, and then I kind of had other things to do, and because I was really just doing this in my spare time. And so what ha ended up happening is um, somebody else took a, um, who there was a, in that department, the imaging department, they had somebody who was trained in uh, regular expressions, and so she gave it a try, and. You can see here, it's like she has several attempts to extract different things with the what she knew how to do. So here she's trying to get major, and then here she's you know, trying to get the GPA, the overall GPA. I don't know what happened up here, but in any case, down here you got oh, getting the overall GPA. And uh, what's she doing on this last one? Rank, but yeah, with all her tr attempts, she couldn't consistently get the name out, and she was. And even though major's labeled on one line, there's a, it appears on another line where it's unlabeled. And I decided I wanted to get both of those just because like the, all that fuzzy junk that you saw on the, on the scans, I figured if data appeared more, more than one place, I was going to grab it in both places just so they could have a good copy somewhere. Um, uh, so yeah, she was working on that for weeks and really wasn't getting something to get all the data consistent. My test I was trying to get like 10 pages worth of data re relatively reliable. And uh, and I was otherwise I was thinking, yeah, it's going to be a lot of work cleaning all that stuff up. They still have data to clean up, but just getting data in the right fields was my problem. Um, so that brings me to my ninth question. Uh, how would you propose finding and extracting the name on all this text? And I'll just give you my answer here. Um, and you can tell me if there's something better. But... Over here, what do we have? Graduation catalog. Oh, no, maybe actually, no, before we get to that, let's get, get, go to chat GPT. I'll show you what chat, chat GPT did. Let's see if I have it up here still. Um, way back here. All right. Now, this is actually this, this, uh, even further along than I remember. So in chat GPT, See if I have that. that no. Uh -uh. No. Well, it's in Chat GPT. Um, well, the first thing I asked it was, "Hey, could you just give me the the data?" Um, and I just asked for it. I just said, "Hey, give me the the overall GPA, the major, and the rank." Ignore the what it says up there. That's the regular. That's my second attempt. So, I had it. I asked for that those fields and to give it me give it to me in common delimited format and it did it it but the problem is it looked great but then it would it would get stuck like after the seventh or eighth it just stopped and wouldn't give me the rest of it and then of course the other problem is it's i only had a few pages worth of data and once we tried to put in any more than that it was it the amount of information we were giving it was too much maybe we could pay for an upgrade and it would do more but um, but yeah, it was having problems. It was essentially having problems that we had anyway, because the data wasn't consistent. 
But anyway, to get around the, the problem of it not being able to process very much data at a time, we said, well, hey, how do you, uh, how about writing us a regular expression that will list the name, oh, overall GPA major and rank in common delimited format. And note, uh, and I had to, I had to go several passes of this, like I did the first one, and it kind of gave me something. And then I said, hey, I said, pay attention here. This got, it has data, you know, note that the data for OA, GPA, major, and rank are labeled as such and is spread across multiple lines because it was making mistakes and errors. And it was actually clarifying some of these things. Actually, it was able to do a better job. Um, so in this case, this is all the data that I gave it. And this was its first attempt at at a uh, at a regular expression that would get that would pick out all that stuff. And so notice in this attempt, it actually found it actually looked for those labels. Whereas other and other times, it would say it would look for a number that looked like a GPA. It would give me that number. Of, it was kind of guessing. And I said, no, no, no. It's a label to a GPA, right? And so Chat GPA Chat GPT did that. Um, in fact, and so like, here's the sample output that it gave to me. And I said, wow, this is oh, great. All right, awesome. this is really good. And of course it would stop right there. So, oh, you didn't want to give me all the data, right? So <laughs> I said, okay, then I took that, I took that and plugged it into one of these, uh, you know, there's all these things that none of these worked. So, so I don't know, somebody who knows, understands regular expressions better than I do could explain why chat GPT thinks that works. But when I put the exact same expression in any one of these, it just didn't find any matches. Um, it's, a, it's hallucinating. <laughs> they got the answers. Yeah, <laughs> no, oh, yeah, maybe it did two different things, right? It just did the, <laughs> just see what it knew how to do with AI and then the other, and it just wrote me an expression. They're two different things. That's possible because I said, because yeah, I was getting frustrated. I said, all right, that's not working. So what should I use to test your regular expression, right? Because it's not working is what is my implication here. And it gave me three sites to use. And those are the ones I tested. Okay, one of these will work, right? None of those worked. Um, <laughs> yeah, I said, your regular expression doesn't find a match in this site. <laughs> so we get an apology. <laughs> and... Uh, Let's see. Think, so, so do, do, you think this is, do you think this is just Kramer on the other end answering what <laughs> you're, you're, you're asking for? It's a really fast typist. <laughs> really good. I'm a relatively good programmer. It's just uh, at least to be able to come up with anything in that amount of time. is, is I mean, the responses on these are just a couple seconds. I was like, I'm kind of blown away. Um, so how how do you uh, how do you get that result that you got from that regular expression you wrote earlier? So it actually can remember things previous in the conversation. Um, and you guys, it apologizes. Um, oh yeah. So what did I say? I'm not. Oh yeah. So it apologizes. Oh yeah. How did you get the results? And this is what it tells me. It says this is what I did. And so it says that it's. Uh, I tested the regular expression by using the RE module in Python, All right? So this now it's actually telling me how it did its work. And I said, okay, well, how do you do that on a Mac, <laughs> right? Because I was looking around, I tried a couple of commands I thought were gonna be Python, and then it gave me the answer for that. Um, um, wow. Oh, no, first it told me, it told me about grep, and that didn't work. Um, and I said, well, how do I use Python on a Mac? And then, because uh, I was looking, I tried a few different commands that didn't work. I said, oh, you know, try Python 3. And I said, so then in Python, how do you specify a text file? Because, you know, my command line on Unix wasn't great. And uh, it told me how to specify a, a text file. And so it's just going through and me, just helping me do this whole programming job here. Um, but in the end, none of it worked out. <laughs> I couldn't get it to work. I don't know if somebody else is more familiar with these things can uh, can actually get their code to work, but uh, it didn't work the way they said it did. Um, and so, I, Eric, so Eric, can we see the can we see the input again? The scan page. Which one? Uh, can we see the page that we're attempting to OCR? Oh, so it's not OCR. I'm just giving it the the data that's already been OCR. 
so all right, here's what you know, this is probably gonna fail as well. This, but this you know. is it right here. So here here's here's a thought. I was thinking um uh if we look at the original page structure, if there's a way to kind of break it with individual Im image captures. Mm -hmm. Like in other words, we're trying to get a record out. What does the record look like? It's either it seems to be either horizontal or vertical or a mixture of horizontal and vertical. Like in other words, well, I'm watching the OCR output and whereas the page looks a particular way, the output looks a different way. You know, and I was like, hmm, can we can we, you know, parse it by column or something? Yeah. It probably probably will fail, but if chat GTP failed, why can't I fail too? Well, I haven't experimented with the images yet in chat and chat GPT. I didn't know that it could it process it. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking there there are utilities that enable you to do scriptable screen captures as mm -hmm. long as the positions are oh yeah. Consistent. In fact, back in, back when I was with that um, in 1997 or 98, we had a program that you could manually define the zones, and it, you could even tell what character set you want, so it would make more intelligent um, extractions. And uh, but the tools they're using now don't have any of that stuff. It's kind of weird, like we went backwards. The live the live text is, uh, I believe, that's built on top of Apple technology. So when FileMaker Live Text produces you know, non-English characters, that's because the underlying technology from Apple is doing it. So FileMaker is innocent. Right, right. It's just using what's out there for Apple. Um, uh, let's see, one other thing here. I actually, hey, well, cause I was getting tired of none of this stuff was working. So how could you find me a loop? Because my thought was I could do this with a while loop, right? So can, and I asked FileMaker, can you can you do a while loop that do all to do all this in FileMaker? And it says, oh, I don't have that language model, right? Um, but it gave me, it knew while loops with Python. So it gave me one of those and I said, eh. <laughs> yeah. and I said, can you, and I asked it again, I said, I don't know, can you write a file maker cal calculation? He goes, sure. So the, the whole thing about not knowing that language model is not true. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it knew, knows something. And I said, and asked me, well, what do you want to do? And I said, and so I gave it this, I said, here, give me a calculation that goes out here and and extracts this data. So pretty much the same question with FileMaker. And it says, here, here's a FileMaker calculation, it extracts the desired data in tab delimited format. And it gave me this. Now, you see that? And this is what somebody else was saying earlier. Substitute all. And I, oh, wow, there's a substitute all in FileMaker? <laughs> I, I did a search. And I, said, there's no, I, I typed it in in the, in the calculation. <laughs> And there's no substitute all. It's just a, and uh, <laughs> oh, so it gives me a warning. It uses substitute all, right? Um, and I get well. I mean, I was just assuming that. Okay, so I mean, see here, it kind of missed some of the things I was asking for. Um, so where do I get the substitute all function? Oh, it's not a built-in function. <laughs> Create a custom function. And okay, okay. So it gives me some this substitute all function. But this one, if you look at this carefully, this one is set up to do a regular expression. And I said, wow, that's impressive. We got a custom function, I'll do a regular expression for you. So then it gives me this. This is not doing a regular expression. So it wrote me another substitute all function that has nothing to do with what it, <laughs> it did up here. So, yeah, this is getting frustrating. Sorry. So, yeah, this, none of this worked ultimately. <laughs> uh, so, ChatGPT is most proficient in Python. It has the, yeah. the largest body of information there. Yeah, and you know, it's just scanning the web for things on FileMaker. So, if somebody had a custom function in a solution and it saw that, it's going to take it. It doesn't know what's what's real so that was weird i actually did a search for substitute all and i did uh, i went to brian dunning's and I, maybe a couple other places and I, I didn't actually see what what they were talking about and it so it, it almost it seemed like it just kind of made that up which would be interesting and impressive all right so this is this is what i actually ended up doing um i did create a while loop right and i said well and i'm kind of just this is all brute force i'm just like trial and error like this i didn't really think about this really carefully but i went down and said hey what's the most reliable chunk of data that that 
doesn't get messed up very much. And I found, you know, rank colon was, was pretty reliable. So I went there to wherever rank colon appeared in the input here. Oops, let's see, I don't have it in this here. Just a second. You're on the second word. Oh, there you yeah. Go. Yeah. So here, because rank is pretty reliable. So I could find the rank, right? And rank is usually has the name on it. So I said, well, and so, but the problem is that it didn't always have the name on it. So I had to put some logic in here. I had to say, well, as you're going through the, you know, find, where's that rank? Find the rank, and then come down here and, and start finding whatever it is you need. If you don't find the name on the line that it's on, go up, uh, go up a line. If it's not there, go down a line. So it has all this criteria to help kind of help find the data that it's looking for. And then ultimately goes out here and grabs all the, we grab all this data and it did a pretty good job on those 10. The three pages here are not great examples because it, it's not quite as reliable as I did with the 10 pages I tested with. But yes, it got 95% of them, in, you know, into the right field using this. Um, I think the last thing I do here is uh, we're capturing all the data and putting it tab delimited format. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to do is like take that entire block of text and just in case I get the data in the wrong, I don't get the data I'm looking for. I don't throw anything away. So I, I have this, um, what is it? This, this, this array. And I said, just grab me that whole block of text, those, all those lines and just stick it in a field. So it will we'll have it and not lose the data that we captured from OCR. So we can always pull that out maybe even and do find and stuff out of it. So that's what I did. And this was, this, worked better than the chat GPT results in this so far. Um, and so yeah, the output of course is up and out over here and that's exactly what I, pretty close to what I needed. Um, so any, any, any comments on that? I would say Eric wins the first round. We have still <laughs> more rounds coming and we'll see. <laughs> Humans are ahead by one. <laughs> yeah, humans are ahead by one. Uh, Just don't put uh, chat GBT in charge of anything sharp or blows up. Yeah, and the, it does give you a warning when you give it a, uh, it says yeah, don't put any sensitive information here. And of course, it's why we anonymized the all this data. Because mm -hmm. there's people looking at this stuff. They're, they're actually, I guess, watching what people are putting in and what results are getting, what they're getting frustrated about, and they're trying to improve it. So it's a it's an interesting uh Eric, I mean, it's great that you went through all this and explained all the steps and to get to this point, but it almost um I, I see this almost juxtaposed juxtaposed on top of uh reality for solutions that we end up building where the reality or the, the map is not the territory. Like the reality is like, wow, it's so much more complex and you have all these variables to think about and, you know, and, 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 you know, we have to, we have to code for those, those solutions, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting um, exercise and, and a reflection of the work that we do, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's complex. So briefly to show you, show you what the rest of this does, of course, this is now all parsed out here. Um, you know, from the, actually the, run the whole thing from the beginning, I, I actually, this button here allows me to pick the folder, which was, uh, where's that folder? DocuTrack? Yeah, this one, you can see it's gonna pull up the, um, going to get this text file first and it's I create an offset page because 1001 really has to translate to this um, to 1779 because that's the image number so this is the offset for that at the export boom and yeah that so that's those three pages all done um, it put all the data these are all separate fields all right um, and it put the images in here Uh, WebEx stuff in my way. There we go. All right, so this is the image that it created, and uh, the, and it picked up. So it's actually only, and it's not putting one of these per record. 
Actually, here, let me resize this stuff. And one one feature I gave them here too is as I'm navigating through, see there's that there's that block of text I was talking about. So in case they need to go find or you know compare the result to what was scanned in or OCR'd, all that's there available for them. And as we go through, it references each, and it's not one image per person. It's it's actually only this is a a one to or many to one relationship here. So there's only three documents there in this one. Well, there might be some residual ones from previous imports, but nevertheless, it's it's doing the eight records are attached to only one of these. Um, yeah, what else did I give them? This was this was I thought interesting. I can zoom in. Huh, maybe another question for the, the code review panel. How do I do this? How do I do this zoom? Anybody? A web viewer or some yeah. JavaScript code? Yeah, it's a web viewer. And uh I was yeah, it's no no yeah, no JavaScript actually. Um so in fact, yeah, because I was watching the, the user and I said I was they were trying to reposition the windows and get things zoomed just right. And I saw them uh, kind of struggling with that because with the, just a plain container field, you kind of get what you get unless you make multiple tabs or something that, that shows it. But this web viewer, that's not the web viewer. Web viewer is hiding behind this. That's a global field that you can drop, drag and drop images onto. But here, um, that's the just some HTML code. And actually I made it so that I could I could zoom in and out of it on the on the whip just based on whip. Um, so and it, yeah, it's the first time I played with something like that, and I thought, wow, people will love that because <laughs> yeah, now it has already has some of the features. One thing I was disappointed about it is like when I zoom in and zoom out, it kind of repositioned. So like if I was over here and I want to zoom in on that space, I have to keep moving over there. I don't know. Can't figure out how I would like make it stay or centered on to the location it's at, and then zoom in. Um, I was trying to, I don't know I, don't, I didn't want to get into JavaScript just to do something like that. But I was kind of happy the way the results just with the HTML. But this was a lot better than what they had. Any other comments? Any uh? Alternatives. Oh, this is, the only, is this part of your sample that you have? Yes. Seen? Okay, thanks. Yeah, the only thing I was thinking is when I run into a problem like this, I usually, instead of using a regular expression, I usually create what is what you, you might call a state machine. And basically, you know, I get to that first line, I set a flag, say, oh, I'm within line one, and then I get the info there, and then, you know, I keep looping through the lines, yeah. uh, setting, you know, different states of, okay, I'm on this line, I'm on this line, I'm searching for the next piece of info, you know, that kind yep. of stuff. Yeah, that's, that's uh, what I was doing with that while loop. Right. So that's, that, as opposed to regular expressions. That's, that's so reg are you saying that a regular expression really wouldn't work that way then? If you're good enough at it, uh, it, it the regular expressions can be really, really sophisticated. I, I have books on it, and <laughs> I will honestly tell you that rather than go to those books and the regular expressions, I would rather sit down and hand code a, a state machine for myself because I can do it faster. Um, yeah, okay. That, that's what that's I do. It. Okay, that's my feeling too. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, so do I really want to get into regular expressions that deep? <laughs> Right. Yeah. Like I say, I've got books on it and great examples. Yeah, the other thing to realize about uh, these large language models, I'm doing a lot with that right now where I'm building a tool to do code conversion from one programming language to another. And I think you may have run into some of the problems. Most of these have uh, significant limitations in what they call the number of tokens that they can handle. 2,000 tokens, 4,000 tokens, 8,000 tokens. Each token is like maybe three characters or something like that. And so when you see it cutting off in what it's doing, it's probably reached the limit of the number of tokens that it can handle, either on the input or the response or both. 
Yeah, I hadn't, hadn't run into that yet. Although you'll notice um, when I was doing my, let's see, data viewer. Current. Notice when I was creating my array, this is created a lot of, you know, this is, it's only doing this per page, so it's not a big deal. But yeah, if I was, my first attempt was, my first look at it, like, uh, if it, if it went through, well, actually, this might end up being a problem if they do a lot of pages. I don't know how many, how large of an array I can make in a file maker variable, but it, it that's, this is where it's like storing all that data, because I didn't want to deal with having to parse this or even JSON, and I was like, ah, I don't, I was having trouble with JSON carriage returns anyway, so I was, I was like, ah, I just I know I know this works right, so I just put it into an array. Mm -hmm. and, well, yeah, and it'll there's be nothing faster than an array anyhow. So, oh, yeah, so that that that's that's always good in almost all programming languages, as opposed to go going and getting data from fields back and forth. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as you have a reasonable amount of data, put it in an array, loop through the elements of the array. Yeah, that seems that seems good. But yeah, if I had to send data like this over to, let's say, an AI model, I'd probably try to break it down a record at a time. Uh, you know, where you've got those dashed lines, and just only send that much out to you know the AI system so that I don't run into any of its limits. Hmm. If I were going to do it that way, yeah, it that yeah, was it was time prohibitive. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. But for something like this, if you already got the uh, the, the OCR, yeah, I, I used the Abby Fine Reader to to scan in some program listings I did in college, and Abby Fine Reader did a pretty good job. But then when I actually brought the program into uh, you know AppleSoft Basic and an Apple II emulator. I ended up with some syntax errors, so it seems like there were a few hidden characters that you know didn't weren't caught along the way. But if you just looked at it visually, it looked pretty good. Huh? Yeah, we had Abby sells all kinds of other products that help do things probably more in a more refined way than Fine Reader does. I think Fine Reader is the cheap cheap version. Yeah, that's what came with my Fujitsu scanners. <laughs> <laughs> the freebie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, anything else? Oh, well, I one other feature here I, I provided for the customer I, because they, they spend a lot of time. I noticed that they'll, because they have multiple monitors and they'll take their windows and move them around and so they can look at different things side by side. And they've got all, so much stuff going on. And so I made it so that when they, this window pops up, if they move this to another monitor, or you know, resize it. However, they zoom it in. It remembers all that. It remembers the size, the location, even the display that it was on. And uh, so there's, you know, that get window, those get window parameters. Those, um, those all work pretty well for just saving the coordinates and the sizes of of these windows. What when are you getting that? Like when you resize the window, you get that. Yeah, yeah. So when I resize this window, yeah, there's a trigger in here. Um, so I resize that window. If I close this mm -hmm. and reopen it again, like over here, uh -huh. same, same thing, same zoom too. That's cool. They just store all that stuff. Hey, this is all simple stuff. There's nothing, nothing fancy in here. No, not even JavaScript. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. So, so what did you do? Did you like create a preferences table and just store that in a preferences table? Uh, well, because I, I, I did this quick and dirty, these are all just going into variables. So if they, yeah, if they close their session, it's going to forget. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's so, but as they're working, it's going to remember because, you know, really in reality, they could just leave that. That was my first solution. Just leave the window up so that they, as they're navigating around, they don't have, so this, this window is driving that window over there, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's so that was the first best solution, but I noticed that people would go whoops and close it, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. And then they did it would pop back open in some other some other way that they didn't want, and then have to resize it, move it around, stick it in another display. Right. And I said, oh, this just just saves you from all that right. <laughs> and just store the the window location when you open and close it and resize it. Right. Yeah, that's really neat. Eric, this whole journey is is really quite. Uh, quite incredible. 
the all the work that you've done to to get to this point and and uh, extract this and and uh, everything that you learned in the process. Really appreciate you sharing it with us. Yeah, sure. Yeah, ironically, this this presentation took longer to prepare for than actually doing all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go back through my notes and re and try to re reenact some of the things that happened. <laughs> It's actually harder than just the brute force of of going through and and finding these solutions and and implementing them really quickly. Yep. And the purpose of the the scan is for them to also uh, cross check this this data, right? Is that the? Oh yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I knew right from the beginning this wasn't going to be perfect, and it sure isn't. Right. Um, right. So you know. The name's not going to be right, so you're going to look up by somebody's name, and that's not going to work. So you're going to have to look at it by year, then you're going to have to look it up by maybe their major, and you're, you're so they're going to have to. There's these things they're going to have to do to you know when they can't find somebody one way, they have to find. They're kind of used to this happening in in other systems that they use, even when it's data right from the beginning to end. People changing their names and all, so they always they're always hunting down people, which is a common thing. Yeah, um, I guess the one thing I would do. If I needed to, you know, kind of have this uh, review process, mm -hmm. I would want to, um, you know, again, I, I guess if you're going from line to line, you already know what you're looking at. But if I click on a row on the left, I would want it to, uh, if the if the document on the right is a PDF, uh, on the Mac OS, when you search for some text, you know how it pops up that that text and it, and it like it highlights it and pops it out. Oh yeah, how do so, you do that? Yeah, I I I don't know, but in uh, in the PDF viewer there is um, there's some functionality there, and if if the PDF is interactive, I wonder if that would um, if that would flow through into your into your view such that you know you you could have that functionality in there. But that's that, or I mean, I'm sure there's some other maybe way to do it with. Well, unfortunately, these are these are just JPEGs anyway. Oh, I see. But you could have converted them to PDFs. Yeah, it's true. And then, well, then PDFs. I think Acrobat has. Well, if you have the professional version, at least I think that it has a way of doing OCR as well. And I think it's yeah. rated as one of the better ones, anyhow. Yeah. Anyway, but nobody nobody wanted to spend money, so we ended up doing all <laughs> doing this everything on the cheap. Mm -hmm. Really. Really cool. Yeah, the problem is buying things is like in in bureaucracies. It's you'll you'll spend months trying to get approval for software, and people get to spend the money on it. Like, ah, eh, we'll just do this in two weeks, and it's done. <laughs> wow. All right. Any other comments from anybody? Questions? Cool. Oh, thanks. And uh, and all the suggestions and alternatives and resources that were posted, those are pretty cool, and we've got to save those. And, uh... Uh, do I need to do anything with the the chat? Do I need to copy it, Eric, or just? Uh, oh, but we are recording, right? Yes. Yeah, we are recording. So yeah. you can save it, Vince. Go up under the file menu. In the WebEx meeting, say save chat. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks, Beverly. Hmm. Well, I don't think I've presented anything, so thank you for your patience with me. And uh... yeah, no, it's 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 really like I didn't know how this was going to turn out, Eric, but I'm amazed yeah, because you know, I mean, if if I were confronted with this problem, I didn't. I wouldn't even know where to start. I'd probably call you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, thank you again for sharing this, Eric. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight, and thank you, Rosemary, for hosting. Thanks, Eric. Let's see. Am I getting my? I think you've proved that we're not going to be replaced by Chat GTP anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, not this year or next year, probably. <laughs> And uh, I think we're on out further out on the scale of, of obscurity when it comes to code that ChatGPT is <laughs> looking at. 
you know, we, we threw some JavaScript in there yesterday that had one small change and it came back and said one more, one small error. And it came back and said, oh, you've got a, an, an error in line seven. You're missing oh, wow. it. So it's pretty good with JavaScript. I'm not sure how you go pasting a custom function with FileMaker in there with an error and say, find me the, the fault, but it's just another resource. Yeah. You know, we, we tend to not trust things that we Google but we tend to be in the mode that we're starting to fully trust or expect a whole, a whole lot more out of chat GTP. Yeah. Um, it's just, because it's, it's, been, it's new, right? It's, yeah. It's new. Oh. It's being presented to us in um, standard language or plain text. Um, and we, we're trusting it more. Yeah. It's so there's an implication, language. I guess there's an implication that we're supposed to trust it based on the way it behaves, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Aren't there extensions coming for ChatGPT where it can actually access the internet directly? Mm. Oh, it's not doing that. Well, no. So the the data set from ChatGPT, I believe, ends around the end of 2021. But I've seen screenshots of ChatGPT, the UI, using uh, plugins to directly access current versions of the internet. Like you can access, you can ask it to do like. Google searches and stuff like that, but I haven't, it's not on, I pay for chat or my company pays for chat GPT, but I haven't seen any type of uh, integrations like that in the web UI. I don't know. I don't know if it's something that somebody's built or if it's something that, that open uh, what's the company that runs chat GPT called open AI or whatever. If it's yeah. something that they're going to be adding to it. Stop. There's a lot going on under the hood as well. well I, I think the Bing's version of it might be using uh, live web data, uh, but the OpenAI one was, was you know, like you say, limited. It's a snapshot of data as of that period of time. Yeah. That would make sense why it's so fast, because obviously nobody can get re returns from pages that fast even. Right. Yeah. Um, look, even Google, it's still caching the web you are still putting um, code into your homepage to say whether or not you want Google to cache the, the site. Mm. And you can put into your robot text file on your website, no chat GTP caching as well. Because okay. huh. we are at a stage where we're you know, questioning the copyright uh -huh. and the author of any content generated by AI. Uh, oh, I see. Because yeah, you could you could Whether, be providing a solution or or training or all kinds of things, and then ChatGPT comes along and steals it all, and then does it for you. Yep, there's mm -hmm. also an author here in Australia that brought out a book where all the images were created by AI, and they knocked back the copyright on the book because the book had images generated by AI, and a person needs to generate the content for it to be copyrightable. In this case they scanned in line drawings and then had AI enhance those line drawings. And now that is now deemed copyrightable because a Line human like. created the initial item and then enhanced what was output or input and such. Hmm. Well, it's, it's, I mean, but the problem is, is, is how to, how to tell that it was done that way, you know. It's not. I, yeah. When you say not copyrightable, does it does that mean the AI, whatever whoever produced the AI owns the copyright, or is it just open source at that point, or or a public domain? I mean, I don't think it's owned at all. You cannot say I've generated this content, therefore it's copyrightable. Therefore, someone has to pay me royalties if they're using it or selling it. So it's treated like something that just appeared out of nature. What? <laughs> yeah. On its own. Um, it, I think back to the Rubik's Cube, where unfortunately Rubik copyrighted the name, not the actual device itself. Oops. So that's why we saw so many knockoffs of the Rubik's Cube, because he'd done the name, not the device. And so if I create a book using... AI generated content and 
give it to a publisher and they they manufacture it, there's nothing stopping anyone else taking that same content in that form and selling it themselves. You you can't make a claim on copyright. So it's it's a lot more questions than answers coming. Hmm. Good thing ChatGPT can maybe answer some of those questions. Probably not, though. <laughs> it's not a lawyer. It's not a paid medical profession professional. No. And as we learned today, it's not a file maker developer. <laughs> yeah. So it's a tool and, and one to be used as that way. Um, there are a number of thought leaders out there that are wanting to put a hold on any sort of future AI. Bill Gates, um, Elon Musk. Didn't Wozniak wanting... come out against it too? Yeah, yeah. They're wanting a six-month hold on it just yeah. until everyone can get their head around what's going on. Huh. Spooking some people. Yeah. But then Bill's already gone and put it into Microsoft, so well, he doesn't stopping us. He doesn't things. control stopping what Microsoft up. does anymore. Yeah, he doesn't own it anymore, right? As much as was controls Apple, uh, yeah. but it's one of those ideas that Bill's already put it into Microsoft. Yeah. I'm saying Bill, but you know his old company, and then he says, "I oh, know we've got to stop everyone else from doing it." <laughs> so. <laughs> really cool stuff I, is coming from Microsoft Office, like the AI integrations with Word and Excel. I mean, those are, if you've never seen the videos, I suggest you look them up because from an analytical perspective and as somebody who doesn't know a lot, like my math skills are absolutely atrocious. Like it can do some amazing things with a little bit of prompting. Wow. Huh. Yeah, I mean, it's working on the data set. The data set is the web. Now, to me, the really, the big key uh, uh, breakthrough would be when instead of pointing the hose outward, you point the hose inward. Now you're looking at your data set and now you can ask it natural language processing on your data set. Like, oh, I have these sales. Like, tell me about my sales. What should I do? Like, and it's, and it's just going to have this intelligence turned on to your data set. Imagine... Oh, yeah. uh, well, that, that's exactly release. what that's exactly what the office integration for with the with AI does is it basically mm -hmm. scans your SharePoint or your OneDrive and can mm -hmm. directly reference documents in your data repository, and it turns that into natural language exchange of of you know, communicating with someone as if you're talking to someone and say, "Can you find me?" Any any documents that have deadlines for this week or something? Yeah, like that. the demo I saw was somebody building. It was somebody building a PowerPoint article of like, build me a PowerPoint article outlining the the do outs from so and so meeting, and it would go through and build a PowerPoint presentation with everything in there. You could refine it, kind of like you do with ChatGPT, where you can refine with prompts and stuff like that. Right. The really impressive one <clears throat> was when they had a Excel file that they asked it to do like analytical sales analysis on just a chunk of data. And actually, I don't even think they had the Excel spreadsheet loaded, just said reference this spreadsheet, tell me top sales quarter three, like that type of analysis. And it would just automatically mm -hmm. give you all kinds of graphs and options for how you can view the data. Yeah, that's impressive. That's really, really cool. It's coming. Round two, Eric. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it'll, it'll escape my ability to even begin talking. Again, this is my first experience actually to do anything with it. So, mm. right, there are new really job useful. descriptions. Oh, go ahead. Uh, there's new job descriptions called AI prompt coming out as well. The same way you need a skill set to put the right keywords into a Google search there's going to be a method of and a process of how to give chat GTP or any sort of AI the right context for what you're after to get the best result. And yeah, that'll be ideal. Yeah, actually we have a, a similar position for that where I work and we call them business analysts. And what they do is they're actually subject matter experts in the business but they have enough technical aptitude to know how to ask the programmers for what they need. 
<laughs> so it's kind of the same kind of thing where you you have these professionals who who can translate and ask the right questions and 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 look for the right you know get the right solutions out of out of whoever's doing your programming so or, or providing your technical solutions all right well so, good night yeah should we wrap it up yeah thanks everyone thank thanks you for... yep so till yes. next time this recording is ending how do we how do we do that i think uh it was me left and she put me in charge so just i just stopped the recording and stopped the, the meeting and the recording will oh, does it automatically good yeah <laughs> I think so, or I can, yeah. Um, all right, Darren, nice to see you. Uh, Tony, Eric, everyone. James, nice to have you here as well. Oh, I know. Thanks for presenting, Eric. It was good. Great, great session. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Especially at the last minute, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so, oh, we didn't we didn't announce uh, the next meeting is going to be. Oh yeah. Adapts. It's going to be a hybrid meeting, right? We're going to have, we're going to join up with uh, FM Desk, and we're not going to have a meeting next month. About what? It's this. Um, well, we're going to do a joint presentation. I think the same thing that Rosemary is doing for New York. It's going to be uh, a Clarice led presentation. So yeah. we'll, we'll announce it. We'll, we'll I don't know. Maybe we should still have a, we we'll still have a meeting. Okay. All right. I think people just show up here. But even without invites, I think people show up on third, second Thursday sometimes. All right. Well, but we have to find it. We still have to come up with something. That's right. All right. Yeah, so this, disregard this, my last comment. Yeah, this time um, is perfect for me because it's now just gone midday, where Disc FM is like a four a.m. So love this yeah. one. Yeah. It's scary for you, but really bad for Alec and the uh, yeah, yeah. Alec. So, oh, look, yeah, um, look, Alex and I have been meeting my 9 p.m., his 9 a.m., and then yeah. my 9 p.m., his 9 a.m., so we've been overlapping at the end of the days. Wow. So mm -hmm. it, it's fun working on a project that costs three different time zones, but you can do it. It can happen. So there you go. I'm going to head out, guys. Nice to see you all. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. All right.